Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Begin with the text, a text from the book of James, James chapter 4, verse 14. And it begins with a statement and then a question. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then disappears, or vanishes. So what is your life? You know, I found something really fascinating. First time that I was placed in an administrative role happened to be overseas. And we had an office with a business manager, administrative assistant, and a number of people on retainer, including some attorneys, including some people that would assist with the DMV and different practices. And I went in and I had my first staff meeting. And I sat down with them and I said, this is so wonderful to be with you, to learn with you. We are going to have so much fun in this relationship. Then all of a sudden things turned. I said, let's look at our handbook. Everybody likes a handbook. It clearly states and I started looking at it, and I said, oh, we're going to have to make some changes. What's the problem? I said, well, according to this, you get 17 days paid time off. That's not going to happen. You get zero. Let's start at zero and work our way up to that. They said, oh, no, you can't do that. Philippine law says we get 17 days paid time off. And my Puritan mindset, my American mindset is, why should I pay you if you're not working? It doesn't make any sense. Vacation time, to me, doesn't really lead to any productivity. So why don't you just voluntarily give up those days, even though the government says you're, you're required to give them? And they said, we're not giving up any of our days. In fact, the guy before you not only gave us the 17, he added on an extra 13 for a total of 30 days. And I said, that's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. You work, you get paid. And they said, you don't understand the Philippines. If you make us come in those 30 days, it's going to be miserable for you. So I looked it up and found out they don't get the most time off. Do you know what country gives the most paid time off? Kuwait, of all places. Kuwait gives you 53 days out of the year paid time off. The next closest is Germany at 38. I thought France gave the most holidays. It's only 36. And other countries, you just look at it and you shake your head. After being in administrative roles a little bit longer, what do you realize what people do need? You can't just work. You can't just go through the grind of working and focusing on these daily tasks that have to get done, after a while you realize you'll either burn out or else you'll get frustrated and depressed. So today's all about reflecting on your life today and reflecting on what Christ has given as an example about how to examine your life and what is important to take time off for. Now, I'm not going to pay you to do it. Most of you may be retired. You're not getting paid. And it's not mandated when you do it or how you do it. But I'd like to encourage you to look at life in such a way that you are trying to find that which is most rewarding for you. I begin with taking time to listen. Did you notice how Christ, when he was with the Pharisees, and the scribes, he listened to what they were saying. Your people are all defiled. Why? What's the problem with the disciples? The problem is they're defiled. Well, what makes them defiled? They're not following our traditions. Well, does that make them defiled? Your traditions? They didn't wash their hands. My mother would have loved this verse. You don't eat unless you wash your hands. You don't go to bed until you brush your teeth. I get it. But you can't make it a religious command. It is not in the scriptures that says they have to follow these traditions. 
that they have to wash in a certain way, the cups, the plates, the couches, the whole inclusive thing that they're talking about. Jesus listened to them and said, your hearts are nowhere near God. Your lips and your mouths are saying things that promote your traditions, but they're not focusing on what Christ has given. Certain traditions get in the way of your faith. Listen to this. Let no one judge you for the things that you do. You know, people, when you say, oh, you're retired. Oh, it must be wonderful. All you do is sit around all day. Oh, no, no, I'm actually busier now that I've retired than I was when I was working. Oh, how could that possibly be? There are so many things in life. Oh, everything's been made easy for this generation. You know, we have so much free time. Well, where's all that free time? And what are we doing with it? Are we listening to God? If you listen to God in his word, you will find that encouragement, that uplifting power that God has offered unto his people. That you can combat people who say, you are not following our traditions. No, I don't have to. I don't have to follow the traditions of men. God has given me a wonderful opportunity to do this. The other way you can listen is listen to other people. Everybody has a story and everybody has a way to contribute to the encouragement of others. You know, it, it was really interesting. We had this honor guard of about eight individuals and somebody went up to them and said, your combined age doesn't equal the guy who we're burying today. You know, 100 years old. And I went up to this one young airman first class, and I said, how old are you? He says, oh, I'm 18, as if he has all the world experience. And I said, you know, um, let me tell you more about this individual than you know. This individual in World War II was stuck in this area, Morocco, and he had to guard a bunch of B-17 planes. He was stuck watching them, and for a number of months, he was the only one there, all by himself. And he was about your age when he did it. And he said, how could somebody that young be given that much responsibility? I said, that's the way it was. They did what they had to do. Learn from those lessons. That this was a man who loved his God, he loved his family, but he was able to sacrifice his life at that moment for five years, from 1940 to 1945, and serve his country. Hearing that, the, this young airman looked at me and said, wow, that's pretty impressive. And I said, go and do the same. After learning to listen, take some time to learn. Now, many of you heard a new word today. You know, my grandfather was notorious for trying to increase our vocabulary. He was one of those guys that would talk about brouhaha. Oh, what kind of brouhaha is this? And I'd say, well, what's a brouhaha? And he'd say, look it up in the funk and wagnalls. You know, don't ask me. You need to find out what the word means. So we learned the different words. Today's word is Corbin. What is Corbin? Corbin was a very positive thing that the Pharisees took and made into a negative. Corbin was, I'm going to dedicate this to the Lord. It is my offering gift to God. But then they found the loophole. The Pharisees went to them and said, if you declare something Corbin, your parents can't have it. Oh, you mean I can dedicate this? The pastor's car is Corbin can only be used for church activities. You need a ride to the doctors, I'm sorry. It's Corbin, you can't use my car. I can't drive you. It needs to be here for people who are coming to worship. You can't give me a ride, oh no, it's Corbin. And they use that, and we learn their mentality in order to get the people to dis disrespect and disregard the responsibility of their parents they gave it to the church and said, you can't have it. It belongs to the church. They still used it. That's the sad part about it. 
It was dedicated to God so that their parents couldn't get a hold of it. And that's just wrong. What we learn through Christ is we have been blessed to be a blessing and we are responsible for others. We are responsible. Honor thy father and mother that it may be well with thee and thou mayst may live as long in the earth. That commandment is God-given. The concept of trying to trick not assisting others. It is still my responsibility to my family. I can't slough it off on somebody else. I have to be a part of decisions that are being made. And you learn that through your life. I had lovely Lucille Mutter. One day she came to me and she said, that naughty little boy. I said, who are you talking about? My son. He's 70 years old. He's not a naughty little boy anymore. Yes, he is. You don't know him like I do. Well, what happened? He wouldn't rake the gutters. He told me, go and hire somebody to do it. And she said, can you believe that? A 70-year-old that's not willing to go up on the roof with a broom and sweep out the gutters? Yeah, I can understand it. And I'm 50. You know, those type of things that we learn. You learn so much from the Word of God about your value of who you are and what you do. God does not want falsehood. He wants you to speak to him with mouths that are truthful on what's going in your heart. If you're frustrated, pray to God and let him hear that frustration. Take time to learn from him and from others about life's wisdoms that we find. And then finally, it is so hard sometimes being Lutheran because anytime somebody laughs, there's always somebody there to say, you know, that really shouldn't be laughed at. We need to have a time to laugh. Life without some of those funny joys just gets stripped away. You know, it's really interesting. This past week, I got to babysit one of my grandchildren, my grandson, and I brought out Lincoln Logs that have been around forever. And I built the, the stable and we built the little house out of these Lincoln Logs. And he says, oh, this is perfect. And I said, I know, look at the horses can go here and the people can go inside and we can put the chimney on. He says, oh, no, 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 get rid of all those people. And I said, why? He said, this is a great monster car garage. I said, no, it isn't, it's Lincoln Logs. We, it's a stable. No, no, it's a monster car garage. Look at it. Boom, boom. Crashed it. Every piece went flying. And I could have gotten angry instead. What did I do? That's him. I laughed so hard. He said, why are you laughing so hard? Never in a million years would I have thought to, the joy in being building would be destroying it. You know? And so he had fun. And we laughed. And we went out and we did things that just we enjoyed and laughing together is that. And he told me jokes and I laughed at the jokes and they were so stupid. I knew exactly what the punchline would be. And we just had fun. Why don't we laugh more? Why do we take ourselves so seriously, our, our life condition of who we are? There are so many joyful things to see in life. We can enjoy others and we can rejoice in the Lord. We can count our blessings and we can be happy and joyful in the midst of so much sadness and chaos. Fourthly, the disciples needed Jesus to lift them up. You know how embarrassing it would be to have a religious leader come in and say you're doing it all wrong? Leave, you're not allowed to eat unless you wash your hands. To make them feel country bumpkinish. You know, these were fishermen who were used to taking the catch, preparing it on the beach, taking the fish that they had just cooked over an open fire, and they used their hands to eat it. That's what they were used to. And so I get so upset when I see people who judge, and their main task in life is to bring others down. That is not the role of a Christian, and it is not the example that Jesus gave. 
He had time to learn, he had time to listen, he had time to laugh, but the main thing he did was he took people who were down and he lifted them up in such a way that they could be encouraged and changed. Lastly, and this is the one I'd like to really focus your attention on, take time to love one another. I gave this assignment to the group last night at 5 p.m. I said, when was the last time that you understood what it meant in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16? God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. So I said, your assignment is go and find somebody to say I love you to that you haven't said it in a long time. Or just somebody that you want to hear the words and just say, I love you and God loves you too. You know how most people dealt with it, their homework assignment? I'm standing out there, what did I get? I got about 40 people who said, I love you. Okay, that, that doesn't count. I know God loves me and I know hopefully that you love me too. I'm talking about people not within this circle. I'm talking about the community. Now, are you taking enough time to do these things? Somebody said it's a brave thing for a pastor to put a clock out, right? How many minutes so far? Who's been keeping track? Somebody has to have. You haven't been keeping track? Almost 45. What time is it? 9.45? 8.45? So it's been about 20 minutes worth of sermon. Is that enough time? I could go on for another hour. Easy. What I want to do, though, is I want to prepare you. Time goes by too quickly. And the regrets that you have, I'm going to spend time with people I care about. I'm going to make the effort to call people that I'm concerned about. I'm going to take time to spend with God. You know, I have a to-do list every Monday morning that I set up for the week. And there are times on the following Monday, I go back to the old list and I look at it, and maybe I only got 50% done and it's depressing. Did I use my time wisely? Did I use it? And then I had to realize if I spent time with others, I used it wisely because if you serve others, you serve God. Did I use my time to relax and be refreshed and be renewed so I have the energy and the excitement to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Take time to do that. It is time well spent. We close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, throughout the world, there are those that find time is fleeting, that their lives can be changed at a moment's notice. We pray on behalf of the people of the East Coast, especially the New York and New Jersey area. And as they prepare for this, for Pastor Hildebrandt and his family, we are reminded that time is fleeting, that time is an important gift that you have given to us, a gift not only to be used productively, but to be used productively in such a way that it enhances our lives, that it encourages the relationships that we share. Help us, O oh Lord, to take time for you in love. Since God truly is love, help us to share in that love and to share it with others. And help us actually say the words, I love God. I love you, O Lord, for you have done such wonderful things in my life. And others need to hear those words also. We see that those things that we need to take time for this morning, but it, there are things we need to take time for our entire lives, however long or however short they may be. Lord, we place ourselves in your loving hands this day, thanking you for these gifts. For it's time to give thanks unto you. Amen. Please rise now as we take this opportunity to express our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son,